Okay, so uh, if we look at this, this is a little bit strange plot to, to, to look at, but if we, if we look at the, this failure criterion, the Morf Coulomb failure criterion in what we call stress space, right? So this is like, um, well, it, you can see it's sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. I'm trying to think of, let's see. Sigma, sigma three, sigma one, one through sigma two, right? something like that. It's a little bit hard to draw these axes, but it, it creates this sort of conic section. And the line that this thing is wrapped around, this, 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 it's not really a cone, it's like a, I don't know what you call it, like a pyramid, I guess, but it's got six sides. Right? So it's got six sides and sort of this pyramidal type shape, and the line that, that it's centered on, so it's, it's symmetric, and the line that it's centered on is the line sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3, and this is called the hydrostat. And it's... A, Essentially, it's a function of pressure. So as I move along this line, if I in, in other words, if I increase the pressure, the hydrostatic part of the stress, the isotropic part, right, the diagonal, if I increase that, then I move along this line. And I move out here. And so this is, a comp this is a compressive regime. This is tension, right? So rocks are very weak in tension. So in, in, if I have any tension, and that's why I sort of drew my axis here, where this is sort of the zero this is sort of the no stress point. So if I just barely put it in any tension, I'm going to be outside the yield surface. I'm going to fail. Right? But if I increase the pressure, if I increase the confinement, the hydrostatic confinement, how hard I squeeze the rock, the yield surface gets bigger. Right? So as I go down this line, I'm increasing the confinement. The yield surface gets bigger. Effectively, the rock gets stronger. So the rock is pressure dependent. We'll see this in some data in a second. But th th this is why it has this conic section. So as I increase the confinement, the rock behaves stronger. And you'll see this in the lab, too, when you go and do tests, right? I mem remember last time I talked about the unconfined compressive strength is not really a good measure of the strength of the rock because in the real world, all rocks have some lateral confinement. Right? And, and this is why. As I, as I increase the the pressure, my, my rock gets stronger. And, <coughs> and, uh, and of course, this, this implies, you know, there's no end on this. So this model here implies that occurs to infinity. The harder I squeeze a rock, it always is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. Is that real? Of course not. <coughs> if I squeeze it hard enough, I'd melt it, right? I mean, turn it into a diamond or something, right? but <laughs> if it had some carbon in it. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, so it's just a model. It's not a perfect model, um, but, but there's, no, there's no end on this model. So if, you, if, you, if you're dealing with materials that can exhibit, you know, well, another thing to note. This also implies, remember, as long as I'm inside this cone, I'm elastic. As long as I'm inside the cone, I'm elastic. It's only out here that I fail, or you know, really right on the surface that I fail with. So as long as I'm inside the cone, I'm elastic. So this also implies, because this goes on to infinity, that no matter how hard I squeeze a rock, if I squeeze it isotropically, if I move straight down this line by just applying more and more pressure to the sides equally, that I never fail the rock. I never permanently deform it in any way. Right? Of course, that's not true either. Right? You have, the rocks have pores in them. And if you squeeze them hard enough, you'll collapse those pores forever, permanently. So in other words, you know, what the way this model, what, what this model implies is that if I squeeze it, no matter how hard I squeeze it, I let it go and it just pops back elastically. It pops back where it was, to its original shape. Of course, you know, it's, that's not true. If I squeeze a rock hard enough, I will collapse its pores, and when I let it go, 
it's not going to return to its original volume because I've squeezed out some of the volume permanently. Right? So we're going to be permanent plastic deformation due to pressure. Right? And so later we'll see that you know we can add sort of a cap on the end of this knob. Another thing we're not going to talk about uh, necessarily in this class, but be aware of, is that I can actually, so in, thi in this model, as I have it drawn here, this cone doesn't ever change shape due to the stress or due to how much I strain it, okay? Which would imply a perfect, perfectly plastic model. Or in other words, you know, if, if I shear it and I hit this point, I'm always going to fail the rock, okay? But in reality, a lot of materials exhibit something called work hardening or strain hardening. And that is, as I shear it or as I strain it, I'll get some sort of hardening behavior. So the material will actually become hard, harder as a result of the shear strain I apply to it. And so what, what that implies is that this cone grows as a function of strain. Right? So that's another complexity we, we can add. And again, I'm just making you aware of these things, but we're not going to actually solve problems in this class like that, right? But we can get far more complex than what we're going to do in this class in terms of constituent modeling. Yeah. Huh. Well, that's a really good question. In the purpose for the purpose of this class, um, we're, we're going to assume that yield implies failure, okay? But, well, I'll show you in a second. Let me just come back to it. I got a plot in a second. You're going to hear a lot in the industry, sheer failure. What they're saying is the state of stress got to that point. Sheer failure. Let's come back to it. The word failure. Because, okay, we're going to come back to it, but before we do, let's make one point. That's a very good question. Uh, I have a stress strain curve. Stress strain. What does failure imply to you? Yeah. But in terms of the stress strain curve, what would it imply? If I actually create a fracture, if I have two pieces, if I have a piece of material and I pull on it and it breaks in two, and I continue to pull on it, okay, what does that imply? Pulling on it is strain, right? So as I pull on a material, I'm moving along this way. And this, this axis means that the more I strain it, the harder I have to pull, right? I have to pull harder. Then I fail it. Do I have to pull harder? Failure should, failure should imply this, right? I've, I've broke my material into two pieces. Therefore, as I continue to strain it, pull it apart, it takes no, it requires no force, essentially. We're going to ignore gravity, of course. Essentially, no force. Okay, so. We'll come back to, that, to your to your question, with this in mind. Okay, so this is just a, the same picture, but now we're looking down the hydrostat. So we're looking at the end of the cone. Remember, I said it was like a hexahedral shape. Well, that's it. And this is called the pi plane. So this is the plane sigma one equals sigma two equals sigma three. So that's the pi plane we're looking down. So this is the, the end of that cone. And what I was saying about, you know, for, for example, work hardening when this cone would, or, you know, pyramid would, would grow in that scenario. So if I'm inside this guy, I'm elastic. If I'm on the surface, I'm failed or plastic or inelastic. I like the word inelastic.
So here's the plot I want to show you. So if I'm unconfined, we get exactly failure, right? So we march up this guy, and right there where that X is, it breaks, and the material has no strength. And the curve drops to zero, and if I continue to strain it, I have two pieces of material I'm pulling apart. If I just add a little bit of confinement there, if I add a little bit of confinement, I move up this line, and now what happens? I get this. Now this, this doesn't imply the material has no strength. Right? This is what's called strain softening. So I'm continuing to strain it, and the force required to strain it is going down, but I still have to pull on it, right, or push. And this is the, all of these would actually be, all of my examples would be pushing. Right? This is in compression. Right? So, so here, you know, I'm, I'm pushing the material together down, and you know, at this point, I get an absolute fault. It breaks in half, and you know, my two pieces slide apart. But here, I have some confinement on it. So I'm pushing, and at this point, something happens. I get some type of damage, right? Material failure, if you will, OK? And it turns out that that point right there is when I hit that yield surface, when I hit that yield surface, OK? But the material has still got, it's still got some strength. Now, how hard I have to push to get more strain is less, but it's still got some strength. Right? And so this would imply this point, this model here, to actually get a good fit to this model, would imply that the yield surface shrinks after after your initial contact. But if you look at these other ones, right? If I apply more and more confining pressure, now obviously, I mean, it, any point after the material is not elastic anymore, when this curve kicks over, that implies inelasticity or a lot of times we use, you know, we use the word plasticity. Plasticity is really associated with metals, but, but all of the theory behind all this was developed for metals first and then applied to rocks later. So, so here we have this curve where clearly, you know, something's going on. You're not elastic anymore. You're not inside that yield surface. But the material is actually getting stronger. So this is where the word yield comes in. I mean, if you look at that 50 megapascal, you know, so the Eagle Ford shale, the Eagle Ford shale is, you know, somewhere in the 60 megapascal range in situ stress, right? So you're, you're in this regime. So when you talk about failure, it's, it's a little bit not clear, right? It really depends on the pressure and how the material is going to behave after that sort of, after that initial yield point. It could get weaker. It could have zero strength. It could have a strain softening effect. But if it's in the right pressure regime, it could actually get harder. And I don't know what else to call this but yielding, right? Even though you know yielding is usually associated with metals and, and slip that occurs in, in crystallographic planes. But but I mean the material seems to be flowing, right? Flowing in the sense that you know as a, it, it's not. It, it's taking very small increases in in stress, and eventually here. I mean, this this point right here would literally be flow, right? It's a flat line, which means that I don't have to increase the stress at all, and I continue to strain. That's flow, right? That's like water. <laughs> you know, so I, without any increase in stress, I continue to strain. Right? So I, I, you know, the word failure or yielding. It's hard to say what because it really depends on the pressure regime you're in and how the material is going to behave after that. And you have to have a, comp you know, if you really want to capture this effect, you have to have very complex constitutive models, M more complex than the, than the more Coulomb failures. So more Coulomb is just going to do, I mean, essentially do this. Right? We're just saying it's a, it's a, essentially elastic up to some point, then it fails. So, you know, I talked about more complex constituent models. I mean, here's many other ones. So, the more Coulomb one is this sort of hexahedral one. I guess for the sake of the video, I should write on the, the figure. 
Okay, so the Moore Coulomb is here. Okay, the one inside the circle there, that's that's called a von Mises or a, uh, I'm sorry, um, well, looking down this axis, it is von Mises. Uh, in this case, we're going to call it Drucker Prager because it, what we don't see in this picture is it also has a pressure dependence. So all of these are pressure dependent material models. They all look like a sort of cone. They all get, as we go into the board, they get smaller. Okay. So we're just looking down the hydrostat to look at the shape of them. Right? And so again, you know, this is just, these are different models that depend on, you know, how well, how well the, the failure regimes or yielding regimes fit the data. In other words, you know, these represent combinations of stresses. So, you know, if I move in, if I move in this direction, you know, does my material actually fail here, or does it fail here? If it, if it, if in the first case I should use Drucker Prager, and if it's the second case I should use the Hoke Brown. Right? So we just have to, you know, different materials behave differently, and ultimately. The reason we have all these, you might just say, well, why not use all? Just use the most complex one right, all the time, the one that can do everything. Well, it, ultimately, we solve these problems in a computer, and when we do numerics, we're always trading off speed for stability for accuracy. There's no free lunch. You can never, in any case, have all three. You can never have the fastest method be the most accurate, be the most stable. Right? It's always a trade-off. Okay. And so what we're trading off here is essentially speed for accuracy or vice versa. Right? The, the more Coulomb model or you know, the simpler models, the, the circular models, the Drucker-Prager type models are the most accurate, I'm sorry, the most speedy and most stable. Particularly the circular models will be the most stable. And, and that has to do with the fact that remember, Remember, um, I said you can't be outside the yield surface. But in, in a computer code, we apply loads incrementally, right? And you're either applying some displacement boundary condition, you're increasing the pressure in the wellbore, which is coupled to the displacement on the wellbore, and you're, you're, pre you're squeezing it open. And that's done incrementally, one step in time, right? One step in time, one step in time, or one load displacement, right? So when you do things incrementally, you know, it's not, a, it's not like a continuous motion where the state of stress is going to be, you know, initially elastic and it's just going to continuously flow and then boom, I'm going to be touching the yield surface and I'm going to stop, right? That doesn't happen in a computer code. In a computer code, you do things in increments and it very well could be that you take a step and if you don't know any better, all you can do is evaluate the constituent model elastically, right? So you take a step in time or a step in load in the code and all of a sudden you find yourself out here. You're outside the yield surface. But you can't be there. That's a, that's a violation of the model. You're, not some, you're either inside or you're on it. You're never outside it. And because you're doing things incrementally, you, wound, you, you sort of accidentally wound up out there. And so what you have to do is you have to get yourself back on the yield surface. And the way we do that is with the constrained optimization problem. We're not, we're not, by the way, we're not doing any of this in this class. This is, if you take my advanced geomechanics graduate course, well, you actually solve these type of problems. So if you find yourself outside the yield surface, you have to return yourself to it, okay? And one of, there's many ways you can do that, but the, the simplest way is you do what's called a normal return. So you basically compute the normal to the yield surface, and you find yourself out here, and you project yourself back onto the yield surface in a normal way, okay? Well, what's the normal? So the, the Moore Coulomb model has these sharp corners. What if I just accidentally wound up right there and I need to return myself normal to that sharp corner? What's the normal vector at that corner? It's undefined. Right? It's undefined. So, so there's sort of a, you know, whereas these circular models, there's always a normal vector. Right? There's always a normal vector. So again, this is a trade-off here for um, Stability versus speed, right? So, for the in the normal models, they're they're always stable, and they're well. It's actually, I'm sorry, it's stabi stability for accuracy, and speed is in there too. But the, the the circular models are always stable in the sense that I can always define a normal vector and get myself back on it, right? 
Whereas the more Coulomb models with the sharp corners, they, they may be unstable in this sense for a normal return algorithm, which means it doesn't mean that we don't have a way to get us back there. You can certainly do it. But we can't use our simple normal return algorithm. We have to do something more complex. Complexity adds computational time. And so that, you know, it's, it's a trade-off. And, and the, what we gain is, well, we, we, we decided that this sharp corner fits the data better. We have to have it. We have to have it to fit the data. So we're going to, we need the accuracy on the data. We're, in trade-off, we're going to give up the stability and speed that we could have if we use one of these circular models. So that's why you choose, you know, essentially that's why you choose one over the other. You have to be an engineer and, and decide which is more important to you. Um, I got two minutes. I guess we'll stop here. <laughs>